Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyana Muhammad Wa ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'da habita fillah Continue on in our study of Bulugha Maram Kitab al-Jami' The comprehensive book Bab al-Bir wa sila The chapter of kindness and bridging the ties of relations we reach the hadith hadith 1258 from amongst those a hadith which talk about the negative traits the traits which are mithmum, which are sinful in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and which negate maintaining the ties of kinship and good relations and which negate or a nafi or something to be aware of uh, because they violate the concept of uh, of good manners and righteous conduct because they are actually sinful. So we reach those group of ahadith and the last group, the last uh, hadith we mentioned was discussing about those most grievous sins. Those sins which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates and which are some from are some of the major sins. And in the hadith narrated Abdullah ibn Amr ibn, uh, ibn al-As radiallahu ta'ala Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, A man's reviling of his parents is one of the major sins. It was said, Does a man revile his parents? He replied, Yes, he reviles the father of a man who then reviles his father. And he reviles a man's mother who then reviles his. This is agreed upon. In this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this shows us that reviling one's parents is one of the major sins. And in fact, when we look at this hadith, we see that reviling one's parents can come in a variety of ways. And the two primary ways, one is by directly speaking ill and evil and foul to one's parents. And this is a gross violation of Islamic adab, Islamic manners. And this is a serious and grievous sin that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all of our many acts of disobedience to our parents that we've committed over our lifetimes. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Please forgive us and have our parents if they're still living, to forgive us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our parents and bless our parents and guide our parents. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And so, that is one of the ways is by directly reviling one's parents. But in this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, we see that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam told us Another way in which a person reviles his parents. And perhaps this is due to the fact that in the time, during the time uh, of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam amongst the Arabs, and perhaps I would go even further to say in most societies, in traditional societies uh, around the world, that generally parents had a respected status in the villages of Afghanistan, in the villages of what we consider now Pakistan and, and India, in the villages all around the continent of Africa, in the Native American, in North America, their traditions, and in societies all around ancient Chinese and, and various Asian cultures, that the parents, the elders, have generally, from my knowledge, have had uh, that they uh, were respected 
And I can't think of a single culture from my limited knowledge, but in my general survey of various cultures, that I cannot think of a single culture that does not hold that respecting one's elders is something very important. And we're talking about in traditional societies. In their when they were in their their more pristine forms, if you will. And in ancient societies. However, with the various changes throughout times, from the Industrial Revolution, from people leaving the countryside to go into the cities to work, to the various to the global influence now with technology, those traditional societies are threatened in many ways in morals and values, and some of the morals and values and things which are responsible, uh, you know, that are now a threat and give, cause moral decay is due to the global, new global values, which tear at traditional fabric and traditional societies and introduce things that were really were not known before. And from amongst those negative traits and traditions that we see being spread, around the world is disrespect and harm and reviling one's parents. And I will give you a glimpse before we get into this hadith of even in the culture, for example, of what people think, say, for example, what we refer to as the hip-hop culture, which originated from African Americans. And in the African-American community, even in my generation, and even still exist, there's still many people that that's important value to respect the elders. But now the newer generations, except except who Allah has mercy upon, they have now destroyed that value to where people have no respect for parents. People will kill their parents and treat their parents as if they are less than equal. Violating and reviling parents and even causing physical harm to their parents. Beating their elders. Young girls. Disrespecting. Cursing. Fighting their elders. This shows you the danger of embracing wickedness and sinfulness, especially as the believers, to avoid taking on un-Islamic values. The Prophet ﷺ said, من تشبه بقوم فهو منهم Whoever resembles a people, he is from them. So when you begin to take those values, and I see it, and I live in the land of Tawheed, which we, we've heard to as the land of Tawheed, but I see the erosion, I see the, the youngsters, even the young Bedouin kids, the disrespect they have. I always lecture youngsters about being disrespectful. I say, I'm your teacher, I'm like your father. How Do you say this to your father? Because I know they don't do that for the most part. And that was not the way of their ancestors. And more importantly, that is not the Islamic way. So very important to hold on to these prophetic values, which are articulated in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which we are studying at this moment. And so, getting back to what we were discussing, reviling one's parent, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned here, that in fact, there are two ways. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned the indirect way because the Sahaba Radiallahu probably couldn't even tasawur, couldn't even imagine that because that was so far from what was in the human culture, but especially more specifically in their culture, that you don't disrespect your parents. Because that was such a big thing of honor of tribe, of tribe and clan. So for them, listen to the hadith again. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-Az radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, a man's reviling of his parents is one of the major sins. It was asked, 
Desi Man revile his parents? So look at that. They bought it. Look at that. They, they, because they, they were dumbfounded. Like, what? Does a man reviles his parents? I mean, that was so far fetched for them. They can't imagine that someone would say the most lightest word of disrespect to their parents. Because for them, the clan, the tribe was everything. And so that was difficult for them to, to solar. So then the Prophet Wasallam explained by saying how in the context of their society and in one of the ways that they could comprehend of how that could happen, which is a very indirect way. And that is the Prophet Wasallam said, Yes, he reviles the father of a man who then reviles his father. And he reviles the mother of a man who then reviles his mother. Showing us that, it's a, that there's indirect ways of reviling your parents. If you speak and look at this in the context of how, because we want to practice this. We want to understand this from this hadith. We understand how we can implement that in our lives. And some of the other benefits that we can gain from this in that when you see something treasured and respected, even if it's something of disbelief, even if it's something of uh, that we consider negative and sinful, that you should be cautious when speaking about it in front of others who may cherish it. And that's from the perspective of Da'awu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'll give you an example that recently happened. Is a beloved brother showed that perhaps some negative traits of racism and he's addressing other Muslims, his other Muslim brothers, and it slipped out where he disrespected, in essence, a whole people because of their race. That's not from Fikha Dawa. But what you do is you open up a door and that's why it's very important to have fiqh in giving da'wah. That to know what a people hold and cherish. I'll give you another example which fits in the context of this. Although it wasn't the father and the mother. But once I was giving some da'wah to a woman. She came to my place of business, my establishment. And I shared the message of Islam. And... However, the, maybe she had a concept that Islam was the nation of Islam. Farrakhan and, and the movement of the nation of Islam. Elijah Muhammad. And I began to speak fairly ill or in a very strong way in rejecting that. I said no and I maybe I'm sure that I increased upon that because then I was younger and didn't have the wisdom and she couldn't understand that and defend it. She wasn't even from them, but she respected them for certain positions that they have. And to such an extent, she had such a hatred in her heart for whites that she began to weep. She said, I cannot forgive the white man for what he did to my people. And she cried. And my point being a habitifillah is that when you give dawah and when you address people that you have to be cautious and you have to have some understanding and some tesor that when you speak it shows us how important the tongue is to be cautious and have wisdom and hikmah when preaching to a people because you don't know and a part of that fic is that you should know about what they hold and cherish so that you know how to address them in a way that can bring them up and bring them away from that, but not make them defensive. And that's what we see in this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the one who reviles the parents of someone else is opening themselves up to be reviled. And the Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions, as we're going to get into to the hadith and the explanation of the hadith, that even the one who 
you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits us from cursing even the false gods. So if you are speaking to Hindus, you're not going to then curse Shavi or, or, or one of their, their gods. I don't recall the names, but one of the false deities that they worship. But instead, you should have a more intelligible discussion showing the falsehood and bringing the people to light with hikmah and wisdom. Because if you cursed Shavi, which could be a, either a Hindu or a something is similar to that, or uh, from the Sikhs, I don't recall. You've opened them up to curse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is absolutely prohibited, and that means you're the sub up. You're the reason. You opened that up. So this is why we have to be we have to understand and be responsible for what we speak about and, and how we address people in giving dawah and having this type of wisdom as a messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam illustrated in this prophetic adab. From this hadith of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, some of the most important benefits that we can derive is first that this hadith shows us that sins are divided into two types, kabair wa sabair, the major sins and the minor sins. And we know that because the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, مِنَ الْكَبَائِرِ شَتَمَ الرَّجُلْ وَلَدَيْهِ The Prophet wasallam said in the left of the hadith, in the, the actual hadith as he mentioned it, he said, مِنَ الْكَبَائِرِ He even used the term kabair. He said, from the major sins is a man cursing his, his parents. Letting us know that there's kabair. And there's sagayr. There's some sins, uh, so we understand from that that there's sagayr. If he talks about kabair, major sins, then we understand from that what's implied from that is that there's sagayr, there are minor sins. So we learn that from this hadith. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi wasallam is that from amongst the major sins is that a man curses his parents, that this is one of the major sins, that in all absolute terms we must avoid, and that this is one of the greatest forms of akuka walidain, as we mentioned, the, 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 the major uh, uh, forms of disobedience to, to one's parents, and may Allah protect us and forgive us for our things that we've done in the youth, in our youthful years, in disrespecting our parents. I mean, you know, Allah, I mean. Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhu they returned to the Prophet ﷺ in all their affairs. They went back to him to, to know affairs of their religion. So this is another thing we, we gained, that their masdar, their uh, uh, foundation of where they returned to was to the Prophet ﷺ, and they returned back to him for their understanding of the religion. And asked him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for us, after the time of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the successive generations, our returning back to Allah and His Messenger, Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, is by returning back to the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Fi Kitab al Kareem, Fa Inta Nazatum Fi Shayin, Furduhu Il Allahi Wa Rasuli. If you uh, disre have disagreements with regards to something, then return it back to Allah and His Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the way we return it to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, unlike the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala, is that we don't ask the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, because he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Firdaus al-A'la. You know, he went to the hereafter. He died. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
but rather we return to his sunnah, his prophetic sunnah. And this is the importance of the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the husna ta'aleem of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, and this shows us the excellent way of teaching of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that he illustrated and detailed masail that were things that would be open and known and things that were also hidden, things that required extra understanding because that's why the Sahaba, they asked, because they, they couldn't comprehend how could somebody, <laughs> it made no sense. How could someone uh, revile their parents? It just wasn't something that they... That wasn't anything common from their, their background. So then the Prophet ﷺ clarified this very indirect way, this indirect path, and how this person becomes responsible for that. So we see how the Messenger of Allah ﷺ uncovered those masail khafi, those, those detailed masail which uh, seem indirect. And this is from his wisdom, and this is from his ilm, and this is from his excellent form of teaching. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In another benefit of this hadith, is it also shows us that it's sufficient for us to just, when we're asked, to say yes, na'am. That this is sufficient. As was mentioned in this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, another immense benefit of this hadith is this hadith also illustrates for us an important qaida uh, faqiyya uh, an important fiqh principle and that is al wasail laha ahkam al maqasid that the means for something takes the same ruling as the end of that which is intended. And we know that how this is affirmed from this kind of the Prophet Sallallahu said, Yusubbu Aba Rajal for Yusubbu Abahu. We Yusubbu Ummuhu for Yusubbu Ummuhu. That a man curses another man's uh, father so then he curses his father and he, he curses another man's mother and so he curses his mother in return so al-wasail laha ahkam al-maqasid here the means for uh, uh, cursing we know that curse the end of having, you know, cursing, reviling your parents, this is muharram. That's the end result. That means the means to it, the wasail, takes that same hukum. That means to that, takes the same hukum as that end. And that end was muharram. Muharram to curse your parents. So if the means to cursing your parents is cursing someone else's parents, then that... It, in return is Muharram too. I hope that's clear. So the means does not justify the ends in Islam. The means to something takes the same ruling as the end. So that's an illustration of that qaida. And bi idnillah, that's clear. Similar to that, another qaida is also illustrated in this hadith of the Message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And that is sadadara'i. And that is, Sadda uh, Dara'i refers to cutting off the, the means to something. Cutting off the means to something. And that's also illustrated. So, meaning that that which is a means to something Muharram, then it is Muharram. So it's similar to 
uh, you know, there's a distinction. Maybe perhaps those Kawa'id, they're very, uh, I think they come under one general kaid or one is far'in on the other one. Another comes and stems from the other kaid. Okay? From the Kawa'id of Fiqiyah or Kawa'id of Kubra. Some of the major Fiqh, uh, Kawa'id of Kubra al Khamsa, the major, the five major Fiqh, print, uh, uh, fiqh principles, if you will, for Kawa'id Fiqiyah. They call them Kawa'id al Kubra, the major five Khamsa. And so, the point being here, Habitifillah, is that cutting off the means to a sin or a wicked sin. For example, uh, another example outside of this hadith, and we, we hopefully understood the example we gave, but another example, just so we're clear on this guide, for example, uh, the means to sin, even though looking, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited that, and that we should, and command us to lower our gaze, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to lower our gaze. This is a me lowering your gaze is a means to cutting off zina. Meaning, you know, for example, the person who's really fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lowering their gaze, not just because they want other people to see them lowering their gaze or whatever the case may be, but they have true intention that they won't even look at that which is prohibited or that which is going to arise their, you know, cause them arousal. If they are, you know, by doing that, that is a means for helping them to avoid the bigger sin, which is committing zina. So I hope that's clear. So that's a part of sadhadariya, you know. Or there's many, many examples, but it's basically cutting off the means to sin. Uh, and... In this regard, also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fi kitab al kareem which illustrates this guide for us and illustrates what we were talking about prior to this in this hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fi kitab al kareem wala tusubbu alladhina yad'una min duni Allah fa yasubbu Allah adwan bi ghayri ilm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al -Kareem. And this is in the, uh, this is a nafi, this is a, or this is a nahi. La nahi, this is in the uh, form in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us or he is prohibiting us from something. And we said prior to this, one of the kawaid principles that we studied prior to this is that Al Amr, and this is from Usul al Fiqh, Al Amr Yufid al Wujub, Wa Nahi Yufid al Tahrim. A command in the Shar illustrates that it's uh, something, an obligation. That's an obligation. Unless there's other Dalil to show that it's, it's not. You know, to take it from being wajib to mustahab or something. And the origin of a nahi, of a prohibition in the shara, shows that that thing that you're prohibited from is a prohibition, is haram. That's the asl. Unless there's other evidence in the shara to show that it goes from being haram to mus to makru or something. طيب. In this ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited. He said, وَلَا تُسُبُّوا الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ Do not curse those that are worshipped or supplicated to other than Allah. Look at that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though people are doing shirk with idols, do not curse their idols. Do not curse the Hindus' gods. Do not curse the Christians' gods. And I want to point out another point with this is I've known brothers in the past in their, their Tao and they were so vigilant in their Tao but not really thinking they could even fall into kufr because we know most of the Christians, they worship who? They worship Jesus. So if you speak ill about Jesus, thinking that you are coming closer to Allah and you're calling the people, 
you know, you should speak about him, alayhi salatu wasalam, as one of the anbiya, alayhi salatu wasalam. Not in a disrespectful way and not, certainly not belittling him, alayhi salatu wasalam, because then you're falling into kufr, thinking that you're doing da'wah. So it's very important not to curse those things which are respected by others, especially when you're articulating to them, you know? So you're giving them da'wah and at the same time, you're cursing that which they believe and hold dearly, what they're upon now. You can't. You're not going to move them to come closer to you. You're going to move them to then, in turn, curse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Allah mentions in the ayah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not curse those who are worshipped other than Allah. For then they will, they will, in turn, curse Allah without knowledge. I mean, because they, they don't have knowledge that, uh, you know, the truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone should be worshipped. You know, you're, you're giving them, you know, they need da'wah. But you are then shutting that door and they are, and that's opening the door to falsehood for them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is prohibiting that, that practice. So that goes back to what we said. And it illustrates this qa'idah, sadadariya, that it's shutting off the door so here, this ayat is an illustration of that qaida sadadariya in that it is showing that by the means to cursing to uh, cursing Allah, to, to, to close the door to the means to cursing Allah, which would be to curse something else beloved, a God that's beloved to another community, so that way they in turn curse Allah. So I think that's clear, bi'idnillah ta'ala. So that's another benefit we gain from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. In the next hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, hadith 1259, narrated Abu Ayyub radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it is not permissible for a Muslim to avoid his brother for more than three nights. When they meet, this one turns away from this one, and that one turns away from the other. And the best of them is the one who greets the other one first. This hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also, uh, you know, it highlights in general, the ruling with regards to Hajr, the concept of Hajr, of uh, cutting, of avoiding and distancing oneself from someone else, you know, cutting someone off, uh, Hajr. And this shows us that this concept is a concept which is Mishru'ah. It is a pro, uh, uh, an allowable, permissible, legislated concept. And that hajr, there are different types of hajr. In this hadith, the mawdu' of this hadith, the, 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 the subject of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is referring to the hajr or cutting off the person who is from Ahla Ma'asi. And this is relevant to this chapter because this chapter is talking about maintaining the ties, the ties of kinship and the even the general relations in a more broader sense. So the more specific is it's referring the title Con the context of the chapter and those first group of hadith we studied in it were in reference to maintaining the ties of kinship, maintaining the ties of kinship. But now we see the hadith that are being introduced are, are broader in, in encompassing the rights and the ties of, of the neighbors, the, uh, you know, so going from more specific to more general. 
from neighbors to the rights of one another. And talking about those negative traits, and this is from the group of Ahadith, as we've been discussing, which illustrate the negative and sinful traits which violate that prophetic uh, mannerisms, those prophetic mannerisms, uh, ad, uh, Adam. And so this hadith shows us the mashru'iyat al-hajr, that hajr is something which is legislated. And that the hajr we're talking about here is hajr al-ma'asi, and more specifically, so this is a, a bit different in its ahkam to a greater or lesser extent from Hajr al-Mubtadir. You know, Hajr of the one who is a innovator in the religion of, uh, of Islam, which is a more serious sin. And this is how the Salaf, they viewed that the one who does innovation distorts the, for example, the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or negates them or makes resemblance between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his creation or whatever the case may be, distorted concepts in the religion that they were committing a more serious sin than the one who committed adultery and the one who drank wine. This is how they viewed the uh, the sinner versus the mubtadiyah and that the sinner was more apt to make repentance for what they did compared to the Muqtadiya. And why would that be? We ask ourselves, why would that be? The reason why is because the Muqtadiya is more inclined to adhere to the deviance thereupon because they believe it's correct. So for example, if you tell someone who distorts, who makes that wheel of the divine attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and says, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ar-Rahman ala arsh istawa, Ar-Rahman ala arsh istawa, that the, the, the most merciful, he rolls above his throne. Ahl al-Sunnah says, he rolls above his throne. But someone from Ahl al-Ta'wil will say, no, 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 no. It means, that, so they will try to explain it away because they're afraid of making uh, any type of tishbi, even in the name. Any ishtirak in the name even. So then they'll flee from tashbi to another extreme to where they begin to interpret it based upon their intellect. And say, no, it means this. No, it means istola. To take the throne be koa. Or no, it means something else. Okay? So they believe that. Yaktaqidhadah. You know, this is a part of their aqidah. Their creed, so it's not easy to leave your aqidah because you believe that it's the truth. They feel that they will be compromising that belief by leaving it. Whereas the sinner, the one who drinks wine, the one who fornicates, the one who does watch pornography or whatever, they feel sorrow most of the time. If if they're from Ahli Iman, they do feel some sorrow for that. Depending on their level. Some people feel like it, you know, their whole chest is open and they cry and they bleed. Some people, their iman is weak and they feel something. They, they feel some embarrassment at least. They don't want other brothers and sisters to see them doing that, coming out of the club and stuff like this. So they feel sorrow for this. But Ahla Bid'a, the ones who are deviating in the religion of Islam, the, those people who have the concept of group partisanship, Hizbiya, calling to their group, calling to their imam, calling to their sheikh, they believe that they're, they're calling to their sheikh that Islam is, is restricted to their sheikh and making ta'zim and exalting their sheikh that they believe that that's a part of the deen. So they're not going to leave that easily. It's very difficult for them to make tawbah and leave that until al until real clarity comes to them and the hidayah, the tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah blesses them with tawfiq, guidance, irshad. The, the irshad and the tawfiq uh, of, of, uh, of guiding them to accept the truth. That comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's very difficult for them to leave that. So this is how the, the salaf, why they used to view that the people who committed bid'ah being more severe. And the mawdu of this hadith, which we're going to get into, has given us insight into this concept of hajr in a general sense and how it relates 
uh, when it's over worldly things, especially. And we'll, we'll talk more specific in our details as we, we get into it. So as we said, uh, so Hadith 1259 narrated Abu Ayyub radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it is not permissible for a Muslim to avoid his brother for more than three nights. When they meet, this one turns away from this one. And that one turns away from the other. And the best of them is the one who greets the other one first. Mutafakun ali. So this shows us uh, there's so many immense benefits from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And again, as we said, the main subject uh, topic is that this hadith is showing the Mashru'iyat al Hajr. That Hajr is something which is legislated at times in the religion. And this requires fiqh fideen. May Allah will be khayran if a Whenever Allah wants good for a person, He gives them understanding of the religion. So it takes understanding to know how to implement these things because this, to make this in, in the shortest form before we get into it, is that mabni ala masla wa mafsada. That this concept of hajr is built upon looking at the musalah and the mufasid, the, the, the harms and the benefits. Is it a greater benefit by making hajr of this person or is there more of a harm by making them making this hajr? And we're going to give examples. And just in the general sense, for example, if we have an individual, they drink wine, or you fall out because something of the dunya, your Muslim brother, this happens all the time. We have disagreements with our brothers and sisters in Islam. This one insulted me, this one disrespected me, whatever the case may be. And so you actually, you have beef with them, okay? And if it is for the dunya, some worldly thing, then you need to, then, then, then this, is, this is the origin of the context of this hadith. Because the Prophet Sallallahu said, it is not permissible for a Muslim to avoid his brother for more than three nights. So this is in the context of if it's something uh, more dunyawiya, you know, just a worldly thing. Uh, but if it is something which, again, you're talking about from the point of aquba, you know, that uh, of of punishments, and that it's uh, you know sin, doing the sinfulness. For example, we say an individual, we see this brother. For example, and he's coming out of the club, or he's known he drinks alcohol, whatever the case may be. So we know this is a sin, a major sin. And how do you deal with that person? That depends on the harms and the benefits. If it's going to be beneficial that this brother is a brother, maybe he's more, he's generally a religious person, and we're all surprised he actually does this sin underneath. So by making hajr, he actually feels great remorse and he actually leaves us. He says, I cannot get caught out like this anymore. I'm going to get straight and I'm on my religion. The brothers have, uh, they're not talking to me. You know, and so he feels sorrow. And it causes him to come back to the religion. He gets back on his religion because it actually is a, a source of him being guided and coming back. Then in this situation, it is mashroor. It is legislated to do that. But if there is a harm, a greater harm, for example, the one who's just hanging on by his deen by a thread anyway, you know he's, he's a wicked sinner. I mean, we, can, we know for those of us who, you know, come up in the West and those who embraced Islam, we also have seen some extreme examples of brothers who were pimps. You know, well, Allah is sad. They're still, they still come around the masjid and stuff, but they're around with girls that they sell. And they are so caught up in the dunya. Individuals like this often are immersed in so much sin that if you make hajr, you don't give them salams, they don't even understand these concepts. They just know that, hey, I'm a Muslim. He believes he's a Muslim. He is a Muslim, inshallah ta'ala, but he's into major sins and he doesn't really, maybe he doesn't even know that much about the deen or maybe he's limited, you know, in his, in, in the time, in the religion, whatever the case may be. He doesn't know much. This individual won't understand you know, there may he may not understand why you're cutting him off. And it only causes him to get further away. Psh, they're not giving me salam. Shoot, I'll just stick with my the people who are who are with me. 
I'll just stick with my crew. I'll just get back in the gang. I'll just, whatever the case may be. So it may drive them away from the path. So that's why it takes fiqh. It takes looking at the musari and the mufasid, the, the harms and the benefits when dealing with these concepts. Okay. Moving specifically to the benefits of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. What we learn from this hadith is first is that it is an obligation upon the believers to do their obligatory duties to one another which is given salams and having love for one another al muhabba wa muwadda but this is the asl the asl that's the asl which is strange how so many groups and sects of hizbiya that they make it the asl is to be suspicion and attack others and to be harmful and suspicious of their muslim brothers and sisters so they make that their origin instead of going back to what the origin is is that we should have love and goodness towards one another. Verily, the, the, the believers are brothers to one another. Al-Muslim akha Muslim, you should do ba'da wa ba'da. Kama qala Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Muslim is a brother to the, his brother Muslim. They strengthen one another. So, your Muslim brother, even if they're from Ahl Bid'ah, they have rights over you. Because they're still within the fold of Islam. As long as they're within the fold of Islam, they still have rights over you. And even if they're from Ahl Ma'asi, they still have rights over you. They're sin, sinners, yes. But they still have rights. They're still believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They still have Iman. And the Prophet sallallahu said in this regard, Wallahi la tudkhulul jannah hatta tu'minu. Wala tu'minu hatta tahabu. Afala akhbirukum bi shayin idha fa'altumuhu tahababtum afshu salam bainukum. And we, we studied this hadith prior to this. We mentioned it. The Prophet ﷺ said, Wallahi, he swore by Allah, by Allah, you won't enter paradise until you believe. So we know that's a shark to get to paradise. We have to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to believe in the deen. And then he showed us that we really didn't truly believe. He said, And you don't truly believe until you love one another. So that means we have to love one another. That's also, is that that's the, the origin, is that we have to love one another as, as believers. So we don't truly believe until we love one another. And then he said, should I not tell you of something? You know, something that's going to help us in this. Help us to love one another. Should I not tell you of something that if you do it, it will cause you to love between you? He said, Give the, spread the salams between you. So that's the prophetic advice on how we should deal with uh, discord and disharmony and disunity between us is that we should spread the salams. That we should be one brotherhood, of course united on the same aqidah and menhaj. But if even if we're not, we still don't go around just rushing to cut one another off because the asal is that we're brothers. And... Another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that this hadith shows us the impermissibility of making hajr, you know, cutting off your brothers and sisters for more than three days if they are a person of sin. And there are many other masus which illustrate this. However, another important point with regards to Hijra, Ben Othaymini mentioned something very important that I think we need to, to look into or share. He says that it is uh, impermissible to uh, make hajr of, uh, of the people of sinfulness for more than three days unless, 
So then he gives the istithna. Unless there is maslaha. And this goes back to what we said in the beginning, looking at the maslaha wal mafsada, the harms and the benefits. And we gave some examples. For example, uh, sometimes the hajr can be wajib. So it, it goes on the ahkam khamsa. Wajib, mustahab, mubah, or, you know, makru, or muharram. You know, the, 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 the status of making that hajr of someone, you know, it goes with the ahkam al khamsa. Meaning that sometimes it can be wajib if it's going to bring that person back. Uh, and so without prolonging this too much more, the Shaykh mentions, again looking at the mas maslaha and the mafsada, the harms and the benefits, and we gave examples prior to this. And likewise, and that the harms and the benefits, that could be for two. That could be for the hajr wa mahjur. That could be for the person who is making the hajr of someone, meaning that they are cutting off someone, or it could be for the person who's being made hajr from. Let's look at this. The hajr is the person, for example, if I say that I am cutting off, I'm not giving a guy, somebody his name is Muhammad, and I'm not giving him salams. Because Muhammad stole something from me, okay? So he committed the sin. He violated my right. I'm not giving him salams anymore. So in the context of this hadith, this, this hajr is only, can only be for no more than three days. And unless there is some, the benefits override the uh, the harms. So, if me being the hajr, the one making hajr of this person, not giving him salams because of what he did, is going to uh, cause him to leave this sin and return my property back, then it's mishroor, it's legislated. But if it's going to cause more problems, then it would, uh, you know, him to be further away from the religion and he's just like, I'm embarrassed, shoot, I'm, I'm not coming around the Muslims anymore, I'm going to be, I'm leaving Islam, whatever. And it causes him even more, something even w worse, which is not the maqasid, not the maqsud, it's not what's intended by this hajr, then this would be, it would not be permissible. It would not be what's legislated. Right. That was from the point of looking at it from my perspective. Now, if we take another scenario and we say, for example, someone who is feels they're not strong in their religion, or whatever the case may be, they may be weaker, and they're trying to be on good, but they have one of their brothers or sisters is known to be in the certain sins and they have an influence on them. So maybe for their own protection, that's for the maslaha of the hajr, that they stay away from that individual. So the point being, meaning that they're afraid of falling into sin and following the way of this individual, that this individual might affect them with bid'ah or they might affect them with their sinfulness, their drinking and their going out with girls, whatever the case may be. So. The point is, is that sometimes we, we're also looking at the harms and benefits for the one doing it and the harms and the benefits of the one it being done to, meaning that the one who's being cut off and the one who's cutting the other person off. So it shows us the intricacy of Hajar, and those are just some points that Ben Othamin highlighted here. Another benefit of this Hadith is this Hadith shows us that it's permissible to... Uh, that it's mishru, as we mentioned, to make hajr of your Muslim brother or sister uh, if it necessitates that to be for up to three days or less. And and we already mentioned about that, you know, looking at the Musali and the Mufasid. Another benefit of this hadith 
is that the best of those people who are involved in this, who have cut one another off, is the one who comes back first to the other one and, and gives the salams. They break the silence. That they're the better of the two. So it shows us that Islam encourages the islah. It encourages uh, the, the, the rectification. You know, people coming back to good and being rectified. And the Prophet ﷺ said, And the best of those two is the one who begins the, the salam. <clears throat> and those are the main uh, benefits uh, of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.